so we've just gotten a read on the situation, the challenges involved in the South China Sea from a uh, retired Japanese sea officer. Now let's get a read from a retired, recently retired U.S. Uh, sea officer on the situation, the challenges involved. Um, I got the pleasure of working with Admiral Thomas at a conference that we did together in San Diego some months ago in the summer. Uh, and I was uh, able to come away from that discussion uh, with a sense that here was someone who could present very complicated uh, and uh, at times even technical issues in a very straightforward and easily understandable way, but in ways that would get to the heart of the matter and would do it in ways that would bring out both U.S. interests in situations, strategic situations arising in East Asia, but also at the same time to think about and to stimulate thoughts about what the possible solutions would be to those situations. Um, and so the pre having the former commander of the Seventh Fleet here to discuss these things uh, seemed to me an indispensable uh, for bringing our discussion forward and for, ch and for bringing out and going deeper into the U.S. perspective on all these issues. Vice Admiral Robert Thomas, now former commander, 7th Fleet, now senior research fellow at the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation at the University of California. Uh, he accepted his position there after retiring from the U.S. Navy in early 2017. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. He also holds a Master's of Arts in National Security Studies from the National War College right here in Washington, DC. My pleasure to introduce my friend and fellow participant in, this, in these kinds of discussions, Admiral Thomas. Thanks, Arthur. OK, I can. Uh... Uh, kind of change my remarks now that you've provided that question. We can go into a 30-minute operational planning session on <laughs> defense of the Southwest Islands. We'll get Yoshida-san and everybody involved. That's great. Actually, um, first of all, thanks, Arthur and Adalia, who is my real adult supervision over there, and the Hudson Institute uh, for the invitation. As Arthur mentioned, uh, he, he was nice enough to say that we work together. He actually provided uh, an incredible uh, gathering and kind of intellectual focus on a topic that is uh, of great interest to uh, a lot of uh, those who follow Northeast Asian security, and that's boost phase intercept of ballistic missiles as an addition to a missile defense architecture. So clearly relevant in uh, Northeast Asia at this point. Um, I only have two slides. You're, you're looking at the first one. Um, and, and I looked at the list of speakers. So you started with my old boss, Gary Roughhead, uh, followed by um, Professor Yoshihara. And oh, by the way, Professor Yoshihara has been helping me uh, kind of behind the scenes, as I have just accepted a uh, permanent appointment to the faculty at UCSD's uh, Global School of Policy and Strategy. So he's whispering in my ear, you know, handing me syllabi to say, okay, Robert, this is what you ought to be teaching. Um, Sally Payne's going to be uh, talking to you after lunch. Uh, Sally was nice enough to come out when I was the Seventh Fleet Commander between 2013 and 2015. Uh, to give us what I call school of the boat, you know, teaching us about the Russia-China dynamic uh, that we were dealing with uh, at the time. Uh, so it's a pretty impressive list, and it frankly, me, it, frankly, it makes me a little nervous that I have this many uh, former bosses, mentors uh, in the audience. Um, so I'm going to try to give you just a practitioner's perspective. And what I mean by that is, uh, I'm going to focus in, uh, try to be a little contrarian, kind of provoke uh, to get after uh, what Arthur teed up as defense and military perspectives on the South China Sea. So it'll really be a follow-up 
on uh, Admiral Roughhead's remarks in particular. Uh, I'll try to keep them relatively short uh, because the question and answers, as you've already seen, uh, are, are frankly much more interesting uh, than anything I'm going to say, and I do realize that I'm standing between you and lunch. Um, one of the things, I almost didn't make it up here after I saw uh, Professor Yoshihara put up that picture uh, with Wushong Li and, and Admiral Rickover. Uh, I grew up in the nuclear submarine force, and so when you see a picture of Admiral Rickover, it tends to make you break out in a rash. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of had to take a break after that one. Thanks, Toshi. <laughs> if I look at the perspective of this particular place, uh, from a U.S. military lens. Again, Admiral Ruffhead talked about lenses, and I'm looking through the lens of 2010-2011 being a task force commander out in Asia, and then just two years later coming back as the 7th Fleet commander. Really, in my view, since 2009, in this place, we have been in retreat. That's my one word capture for what we've been doing. We've used words like pivot and rebalance and uh, engagement. And uh, the one I love is, hey, we're, we're trying to figure out how to shape China's behavior. Okay? And then we, um, in our policy discussions, you'll see this one word creep in time and time again, uh, hope. And uh, my old boss, Admiral Rickover, or uh, Admiral Roughhead, um, reminded me one time when I was working for him, he said, Robert, you know, hope is not actually a course of action. So um, since 2009, I, I really feel since the PRC abandoned the charm offensive about that time and started uh, pressurizing um, their neighbors in the South China Sea, that we have been in at least relative retreat. Um, Sandy Winnefeld, when he was the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, I remember him in multiple meetings uh, and out in public talking about this accumulation of advantage uh, by the uh, People's Republic of China. I then uh, kind of piled on with that uh, when I was the Seventh Fleet Commander and in my engagements with my, my Chinese counterparts, Admiral Yuan, North Sea Fleet Commander, and Admiral Shin, South Sea Fleet Commander. Uh, Admiral Shin, I think now, is Chief of Navy uh, for China, Wu Li's replacement. Um, I even used the words coercion campaign. I s soon got a note from my boss, Admiral Harris, who was the PAC Fleet Commander at the time, he said, Robert, you've been identified in the Chinese state media. I said, really? And he says, yes, they, you know, our kind of uh, translation of it is they're accusing you of practicing propaganda kung fu. <laughs> and I said, OK, I'm not sure what that means. He said, I think that's probably the high water mark of your naval career, you know, to be called out in the Chinese state media. But I was pretty. Uh, up front uh, with my engagements uh, with the Chinese at the time to say, hey, this co coercion campaign, you know, you're actually bringing um, the people toward the US 7th Fleet that were not typical partners. I remember giving a, a speech in Manila. And after the speech, it was Vietnamese diplomats and representatives. Admiral Thomas, what are you going to do when they fire on us here in the South China Sea? A very, very interesting question. And you've seen our relationship with Vietnam. And Admiral Yoshida answered the question on the Japanese relationship with Vietnam. It's kind of in a stage of bloom right now, compliments of this coercion campaign. So as we go back and we look at US defense policy and, and really the military aspects of supporting that foreign policy uh, over the past decade, remember, we have tried to parse access and sovereignty. Right? Our official line was always, hey, you know, we're all about access to the high seas. 
We don't want to get ourselves involved in the territorial disputes uh, that surround conflicting claims in the South China Sea. Uh, the Philippine government, of course, you know, has always looked at us and said, what does that really mean? So as a treaty ally, are you going to be there when the People's Republic of China perceives that we've changed the status quo and reacts badly to it? Are you with us or not? And we've left that uh, rather ambiguous uh, in my terms, or at least in my view. Uh, if success is avoidance of a kinetic exchange with the People's Liberation Army Navy uh, over the past decade, then absolutely our policy has succeeded. Um, if success is measured by the People's Republic of China, its military, its military militia, its fishing fleets, and so on, actually abiding by the current international norms, rules, standards, laws that we would consider acceptable, then I would offer, as everyone uh, before me has mentioned, this gray region, then our policy is failing. Um, I think uh, Professor Yoshihara and others made it very clear, you know, almost half the world's com commerce goes through this pathway. A third of the oil and gas that goes to Asia goes through this pathway. Uh, but the discussion really needs to be much larger. And I'm going to attempt to operate this. Let's see. Let's try that one. There we go. So this is really my favorite chart. It's uh, from 2007. And it it kind of scopes the entire, as Admiral Roughhead said, Indo-Pacific. And I was very uh, pleased to hear my former boss use that term, Indo-Pacific, because India's influence is growing in what we used to call just an Asia-Pacific uh, theater. He talked also about the COCOMs and their alignment, the combatant commanders. Uh, and how we kind of arbitrarily draw these lines. He also gave you a hint on what uh, US command and control might need to be in the future uh, out in the Western Pacific, uh, as he pointed out. And I, I'm not sure it was an actual, I think it was actually a dig at his former baby one star going, you know, Thomas is the Seventh Fleet commander. He obviously needs some help. So we're going to have to change the C2 structure out in Asia. But he's absolutely right. This is too big of an area with too many responsibilities for a forward deployed naval force that's actually less than 50 combatant ships, about 140 aircraft, and 20,000 sailors. And you count the third Marine Expeditionary Force, 20,000 Marines, on any given day. That's actually, you say, well, we rebalanced, right? Well, that's the rebalance. And uh, from a military perspective, I used to talk about capabilities versus capacity. Uh, but my former boss, I think, kind of blew that one open when he talked about the need for capacity. Um, remember when the United States Air Force a while back came up with this, God, it was almost a decade ago. This idea of virtual presence. Somebody said, no, that's equal to actual absence. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. When you talk about capacity, um, we cannot uh, defy the laws of physics. Ships and airplanes can only be in certain places at certain times. Yes, the electromagnetic spectrum and cyber and space are going to become more and more important. And to kind of characterize territory in, that, uh, in those domains is very, very difficult. Uh, but in this region, if you don't have capacity and the other, the potential adversary has mass and short lines of communication, you can see how you're on the wrong end of the equation uh, very, very quickly. So um, 
it shouldn't be lost on anybody that also we got a great indicator of how things are going uh, from the 19th Party Congress. And uh, Sally may talk about this uh, after lunch. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, was very, very clear that uh, not only was he not going to name a successor, that um, his particular leadership style is looking more and more like Chairman Mao than his three previous predecessors, that the Communist Party is controlling more and more of everyday functions, uh, including the military. In fact, he's even dressed himself up in digital camouflage and visited his uh, military uh, outposts, his, his Navy, his Air Force. Um, pretty, imp pretty impressive message to say um, to uh, Admiral Yoshida's uh, point and to Toshi's point, uh, we're here, we're a permanent influence, and get used to it. Uh, Admiral Harris, I think, was probably the canary in the mine shaft when he said, just down the street in uh, testimony, uh, he used terms like the Great Wall of Sand in the South China Sea. And he went on to say, really, the People's Republic of China has de facto control of the South China Sea. And uh, I would not uh, argue that particular point. Um, Xi Jinping has made it very, very clear that the US military presence is neither required nor desired in the Western Pacific, um, sees us as an impediment to progress. And uh, I think he's going to try to uh, very hard to make that stick. So if you look through the lens of the Chinese Communist Party leadership, um, in my view, they have a relatively strong hand, and they're playing it very, very well. Uh, you heard this talk of gray zone tactics and a gray region. Um, they have really brought that um, sophisticated approach, uh, not just to the Western Pacific, but uh, as they reach out uh, globally, uh, you see that more and more uh, in their toolkit. Uh, two Chinese colonels, two PLA colonels in 1999 uh, wrote a book, it's not very long, it's been translated into English, called Unrestricted Warfare. If you don't have it in your library, I recommend you put it in your library. It's a pretty straightforward read, and as you look at this, now written in 1999, they basically gave you the Chinese playbook in the South China Sea, East China Sea, how they feel about the Korean Peninsula, where they're going with the Indian Ocean, Oceania. Um, these two PLA colonels did a great job of publishing the playbook, and unfortunately, we were not uh, reading it at the time. Um, again, you see the, the pressurization or this coercion campaign coming up in, in subtle gray zone ways. Uh, this last week, um, the Chinese leadership declaring themselves as a near Arctic state. I, I, I have no idea geographically what that means, a near Arctic state. But Admiral Roughhead uh, pointed out, and I think Professor Yoshihara pointed out, that um, with uh, climate change, with the possibility of um, ice-free zones in the Arctic, and to commercially make it viable, you need about 12 weeks straight of you know, ice-free operations, that the Chinese are very, very interested in their Belt Road initiative getting after uh, resources and commercial transit in the Arctic. So there isn't going to be any place on the globe where um, the People's Republic of China uh, doesn't bring influence. They'll bring it um, primarily on the military side through this very modern global navy. And it's been a global navy for almost a decade, in my view. 
We've just been kind of in this state of denial. Uh, if you are looking at it through the Chinese lens, this is a very natural evolution. Uh, if I'm the Chinese, I probably got a little tired and, and um, you know, uh, Professor Yoshihara talked about it, this century of humiliation. Well, post-World War II, uh, the People's Republic of China had to watch the U.S. 7th Fleet basically transiting what they consider across their front lawn, and they've had to do that for about the past 70 years, and they're uh, tired of it. And they've made it known that uh, those days are over. Um, with respect to the South China Sea in particular, remember, this is not new. Not only the 1948 you know, kind of maps, but the 1992 law that they passed to say, you know, this is uh, our territorial waters. You know, uh, the difference now is in 1992, remember when Professor Yoshihara showed those two ships? In 1992, the only thing they had was that little one in front. Now they've got a very, very capable uh, Coast Guard. They took all the maritime law enforcement elements, put them together. Um, their Navy is modernized, their surface fleet is very impressive, and there's one other aspect of it that really kind of tipped uh, my thinking as far as how much progress they had made. When I visited uh, Qingdao in 2000, early 2014, and then I was at the South Sea Fleet headquarters in early 2015, they have moved off of the old conscription model. They have looked at the US Navy and the professional NCO Corps, that mid-level enlisted professional that really runs our Navy, and said, we want some of that. How do we get after this professional NCO Corps? And they have gone about the business of using our playbook and building that model. And that will take modern widgets and allow them to operationalize them that much faster. No matter what you build, it has to be integrated into a fleet and then be able to be used properly. For us, when we brought on digital fire control systems in the submarine force, it took us 10 years to actually figure out all the ins and outs of how to use them. Well, they're going to accelerate that process, not just in their acquisition cycle, which operates inside of ours at a rate of about three to one, but also with the professional integration of that into their military forces with this professional NCO Corps. So I think that that's a real uh, kind of a barometer of their progress. Uh, with their spatial and their temporal advantages, uh, it is clear that um, Southeast Asian allies, partners, and friends, as we would like to call them, they are all busy, busy trying to figure out what their hedging strategy is going to be. To your point, whether we're going to show up uh, as part of our treaty alliances, uh, our credibility is going to be at stake. And then most of them will make a calculation. At what point do I cut a deal with the hegemon of Asia, China. Some of them are making that calculation now, and I think that we're naive if we think that uh, we're going to continue to um, operate with impunity uh, throughout the region. So finally, um, you know, I've kind of kicked out a few thoughts. Uh, I've used the word retreat. I know that somebody's going to chafe against that. Uh, I purposely used it just so that we can get irritated at each other. Um, really a point of departure for the discussion. Um, but again, I, I commend two things to you for your library. One is uh, Unrestricted Warfare. The other is uh, a book uh, on the South China Sea, uh, Hayton's book uh, back in 2014. I thought that was a pretty balanced presentation. Uh, Bill has kind of changed his thinking and is now a former uh, BBC uh, correspondent. Um, so his thinking's a little all over the map right now, but 
I thought uh, in that book in 2014, a very, very good perspective on the history, the geography, the politics, the economic issues, and dealing with a rising China. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Arthur, and we will get about the business of the bare-knuckled discussion. Yoshida-san. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Um, I am going to presume on my privilege as a moderator for asking first questions to ask two questions, one macrocosmic, one microcosmic. And the Mac, which one do you want first? Uh, the fact that either of them are cosmic is interesting. Is interesting by itself. Um, let's start with the. Let, let, let's go with the macrocosmic, and then we'll go to the go to the other question. The macrocosmic actually was inspired by a comment that Admiral Ruffhead gave in his keynote address, in which he said that the the, the fact of the matter is is that the U.S. needs a new organizational command structure, or the um, uh, Indo-Pacific area, and also for East China Sea and South China Sea. Now, as a student of the British Navy, one of the things that I realized writing my book on, on how the British Navy shaped the modern world was how precisely decisions of this kind, of reorganizing or rethinking command and organizational structure can have a decisive influence on who wins and who loses conflicts and on how the dynamics of deterrence works. The example that comes to my mind uh, was the creation of the Western Approaches Squadron in the early 18th century, which decisively shifted the, the, the balance between the Royal Navy and the French Navy in terms of the French Navy's ability to challenge, uh, challenge uh, Royal Navy in, in, its own, in its own waters, and later on also in terms of its ability to project force in a global, as a global presence. So without putting you in the spot of having to answer for Admiral Ruffhead, what's he thinking about, what let me pose to you the question of, if you were to come up, think about how you would change the command and organizational structure. You've already implied that PACOM's area is way too large, there are too many missions. What would be the key features in your mind? Well, um, so Admiral Ruffhead gave you a hint on that one, and that was uh, it's also um, actually uh, very much in the current focus of the Pacific Fleet Commander Scott Swift. Um, he has gone about in uh, very publicly uh, somewhat er erasing the international dateline. For those of you who don't know, the Seventh Fleet area of responsibility goes from the international dateline to the India-Pakistan border. If you dropped longitudes along those lines, uh, that's 36 countries. Um, and I gave you the data on kind of the day-to-day -day force in the US 7th Fleet, and that's not counting the transitors that are headed over to the Persian Gulf routinely. Um, the proposal would be, um, look at US 3rd Fleet. This is kind of back to the future. For those of you who are uh, you know, history buffs, as you look at the Third Fleet, Seventh Fleet dynamics during World War II, um, is there something that looks like Third Fleet forward to um, take some of that burden off of Seventh Fleet? Do we geographically slice up the area of responsibility? Or do we do it by mission set? Do we do it in different domains? Um, we all tend, uh, at least I do, the, the chart's no longer up. I tend to default to geography. And so you probably want to um, focus spans of control and uh, areas of responsibility in a way that Seventh Fleet, in my view, might be the Northeast Asia piece of it. A third fleet forward could be the Southeast Asia portion of it. And remember, you also have the third Marine Expeditionary Force out there. Uh, you have other players in the joint force. Um, and Admiral Ruffhead can give you a much better view of that globally, how you know, Fifth and Seventh Air Force, Pacific Air Forces, 
Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of options there to get after this uh, more precise command and control forward for the purposes of war fighting. Seventh Fleet's very well set up for what we would call phase zero. You know, this kind of, uh, I'll call it peacetime tension, but responding mostly to operations other than war. Seventh Fleet spends more time on humanitarian assistance, disaster response, uh, and other operations other than war than it does on, on uh, war fighting, obviously. So are you ready for the microcosm? Yes, we're going to get into the microcosm. And that is, we think about, as former commander of Seventh Fleet, you look at the assets for that fleet. If you were to single out one or two assets that the Norton Seventh Fleet already has mm -hmm. that haven't been used or that could be used as ways to help to constrain or contain Chinese activities in South China Sea, up to and including the scenario that we had presented earlier of a, of a large inter, sort of, uh, 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 fleet in being presence, uh, or a move towards, let's say, an amphibious landing in Senkaku, if it's in Senkaku's, if that's useful for you. What would be those one or two assets that we, that we have, but we really aren't using effectively? Well, ooh, that we aren't using effectively. Um, I, I think that um, we all, all of the speakers today would probably line up behind the fact that the U.S. Navy, we'll, we'll stick with the maritime aspects of this. Sure. The U.S. Navy um, still enjoys an undersea warfare advantage. Um, we use that um, in a very quiet way. Um, you've you've got to be careful if you want to use that in a more demonstrative way. That might be considered more effective, but that may, from a future warfighting perspective, uh, actually kind of tip your hand. Yeah. So that's that's one that I kind of discount. Um, the that asset which I found uh, to be most useful was maritime patrol reconnaissance aircraft. Because our allies, the Japanese, you know, they have 80 P-3s, and they're building their own P-1. And, uh, um, you know, we brought out P-8, which just has much better legs, and uh, it needs some equipment to round it out, but um, very, very capable uh, future surveillance aircraft. Uh, so I think you could leverage the maritime patrol reconnaissance uh, aspects of uh, the U.S. forward deployed force, uh, the Japanese, uh, the Australians play in that same regime. Um, so there's one area that I think uh, we could improve our efficacy because you can use it for messaging. You can use it for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. But you can also use it for diplomacy. Uh, it's, and it's fairly fast to move around the theater. Admiral Ruff had talked about this tyranny of distance. Uh, one of my biggest frustrations, of course, is you know, everybody goes, wow, you've got these Tago ships, and you have uh, these uh, Arleigh Burke class destroyers, these beautiful multi-mission destroyers. But again, they can't be multiple places at once. Hmm. There's, the, there's the rub. What I like about this, too, is that it also addresses all three of the points that Admiral Yoshida raised as the lessons drawn from, right? Absolutely. The, the question of ISR, ISR capability that would come from such patrols. You've got the presence. There they are. <laughs> there they are flying by, flying mm -hmm. over. And then you've got the third one, which is on the diplomacy side as well as a kind of an assertion. Uh, We're yeah, here and, 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 and a typical over. example is you could do this with a small footprint with someone that's not a treaty ally but thinking about being your friend, at least situationally. Yeah. I think Malaysia, I think Brunei, I think Indonesia in, the, in that regard. Uh, and you'd sure like to set up ahead of an actual kinetic fight some possible expeditionary places to go because that which you think is going to be yours when the shooting starts uh, may be unusable. And this could be done with both unmanned and manned. Absolutely. So you pointed out uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, Admiral Roughhead pointed out uh, unmanned underwater vehicles. Um, 
we've got to get on with that. That is a force multiplier that absolutely um, needs to be accelerated. If you think about, if I'm from the looking at it from the People's Republic of China perspective, and I want to continue my gray zone efforts, all of a sudden space, cyber, and undersea look really, really good. And the reason they look good is because it's hard to attribute to a particular actor in those domains. And that seems to me, from a gray zone tactic perspective, those are three domains that I would want to go after. Space, cyber, and undersea. Do you have some questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Please. Thank you, Admiral. Otto Kreischer, Sea Power Magazine. On the, uh, the issue of command and control of, of the area, you know, uh, General Dunford has been talking recently about you know, every, any conflict in the future will be you know, multi-domain and, and trans-regional. Uh, and he's looked at you know, fuzzing up the uh, COCOM a AORs. Uh, do, you, do you see the need for you know, breaking up uh, uh, PACOM you know, uh, or doing something else to put that trans-regional uh, focus on, on the command and control to, you know, to give the, the, br the broader area of responsibility? Well, my former boss is still sitting in the background, and he's actually better positioned to answer it from the what I call the larger uh, four-star perspective. But, uh, you know, I take it, um, from command and control to not, not that strategic PACOM level, but then translating it to what I call the operational level of war. And that's where this, this idea of numbered fleet commanders, um, Nora Tyson, who was just recently retired and was the third fleet commander, she was really the first one um, that was used forward by um, Commander Pacific Fleet. And, and that, I think, kind of at that operational level of execution, that's where I think the changes need to be made. You know, you can play with combatant commander boundaries, and one of the things I always thought would, would be clever is to actually line those up with the same boundaries the State Department uses. You know, it's kind of like, hmm, why do we have this disconnect? But anyway, the numbered fleets, I call it that kind of three-star operational level commander that's going to be the executor forward. That's where I think the command and control piece absolutely has to be resolved. One of the most interesting um, challenges is um, the Korean Peninsula. So you've got an army four-star over there as US forces Korea. And uh, then the combatant commanders for that Army Four Star, remember, aren't all there, they're not there all the time. The land component is, the air component is, but the naval component's kind of all over the place, the Seventh Fleet commander. And uh, so, how do we get after this notion of um, that execution, command, and control in a coherent way where it would be? Uh, not this huge ramp up while a potential adversary with both the spatial and temporal advantages, example would be the People's Republic of China, has all those war fighting advantages. You're not going to have time to say, well, let's pencil out a new command and control. You've got to get it in place ahead of time. You've got to practice it. Oh, by the way, your allies better understand it because they need to know who's who they're talking to on the other end of the phone. Uh, I think we give ourselves a little bit too much credit right now as far as the amount of integration in our combined joint war fighting. Uh, even with the Japanese, who are probably our closest allies, and the Koreans right there too, and we practice with them a lot. But the fact of the matter is, you've got to just reps and sets. It's like going to the gymnasium. You've got to be there every day, and you've got to be doing it at the high end. And that's a costly proposition. So 
I think I just started to scratch at your question, but I think it's really the, the three-star operational level of war command and control that has to uh, change and then be implemented and practiced. Good questions around. We've got a string of them. So why don't we, how about this? We start there and we'll work our way around. Uh, yes, Ping Liu of China Times, Taiwan. Uh, Admiral, you just mentioned um, uh, the um, role of uh, Seventh Fleet in the Western Pacific. Uh, of course, we know the, um, just three days after, or two days after the uh, Korean War broke, um, President Truman ordered the Seventh Fleet to patrol Taiwan Strait. Without that order, I, I wouldn't imagine if we still have a democratic and free Taiwan. Uh, so my question is, uh, during your interaction with the uh, People's Republic of China's uh, naval officers, admirals, what's uh, their opinion on the um, Taiwan issue or on the U U.S. Navy? I mean, are they confident or they are afraid to have another potential conflict with the U.S.? Thank you. I think the um, military leadership in the People's Republic of China uh, has done a very, very good job of staying aligned with the Communist Party leadership in that a, our objective is to keep the tension just below that point of armed conflict with the U.S. We want to keep the U.S. Uh, somewhat occupied, kind of at a slow boil. We will continue to uh, systematically weaken their alliances over time. Again, we have both a spatial and temporal advantage in that regard. Um, I think their military leadership understands that very, very well. And um, so it is natural for them, and we've, we keep going back to this notion of kind of gray zone tactics. Well, the gray zone strategy is let's achieve our political objectives that used to be strictly the domain of war, and, and let's achieve them without actual, an actual kinetic fight. It may look like war in different domains, but uh, they're very confident that they can thread that needle, keep that threshold, uh, and, and keep us just at the slow boil. Uh, with that in mind, um, I think um, there's, there's a question out there uh, that, that is being debated, and that is, given our, uh, tai the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, given this kind of ambiguous uh, relationship that the U.S. has with Taiwan militarily. You know, for example, I think everybody knows that uh, a U.S., an active U.S. flag officer can't show up in Taiwan, right? It's not... You don't, you don't go do exercises with the Taiwan military the way you do with the Republic of Korea military and have flag and general officer exchanges the way you do it. There's kind of this almost track two dialogue that goes on, and it's, it's a couple of retired U.S. officers and, and the Taiwan military that kind of conduct this uh, exchange. Uh, so it's, um, it's problematic from a future uh, command and control perspective, again, if you don't practice with an ally, um, how are you going to do when uh, the pressure's on? Um, a, a big concern, this ambiguity posture has served us pretty well for the last 70 years, but how much longer uh, will it hold up with you know, Chinese pressure. I, I don't know the answer. The Economist had a great article on that issue, you know, months ago, and uh, they think it's rather short-lived. Okay, we're going to come here and then to the back. With anyone, if you want to catch the gentleman here, and then we'll go straight back. Thank you. Um, thanks, Admiral, for your comments. Um, <clears throat> Prashant Parmaswaran with The Diplomat magazine, um, and originally from Malaysia, um, I really enjoyed your, your perspective, on, uh, particularly on the region, um, and you kind of raised the central point, which as you travel around Southeast Asia, that question is really being posed, which is, 
at what point do these countries consider cutting a deal with, with China? Sure. And how visible is the U.S. presence going to be, not only now, but in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And I'm wondering if you could play out that scenario a little bit. Um, so let's assume that these, some of these claimant countries and some non-claimant countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, five to 10 years from now, appear less willing to be involved as an ally or partner of the United States. I think the Chinese are actively thinking about that scenario and thinking Absolutely. our goal should be to pry the United States away from its allies and partners so that it causes the United States to make a call in the future, which is how committed or interested are we in the South China Sea? And I think that's the fundamental question, right? Absolutely. And if the United States makes, makes a call that without these allies and partners, we don't think that we're as committed to the South China Sea alone to be able to take these risky endeavors, the Chinese put themselves in a more favorable position. Because as you pointed out, this is their front lawn. And I think they calculate the United States, it doesn't really have that much at stake compared to us. So my question is, we talk about the military side, and I think we have that down, but the sense, talking about this for about a decade now, with the Chinese assertiveness, there seems to be, at least the Chinese thinking on this, is that the Americans haven't really come to a consensus that the South China Sea is a vital U.S. national security interest for us to be not only with our allies and partners, but even if our allies and partners are not involved, we are going to be involved. And if the Philippines doesn't take its stance on the Scarborough Shoal, we're going to preserve international law to go ourselves into Scarborough Shoal. That puts us in a very difficult position. But I'm wondering, you know, what's your response to that? If we face that kind of environment in five or 10 years, what do US policymakers do then? Well, first of all, um, the way you framed the discussion was much better than my remarks uh, earlier. Uh, I think you just, you know, kind of put that framework together very, very nicely. In fact, I'll ask you to be a guest lecturer in one of my classes at UCSD. But um, I'm, I'm struggling with that same question. So as a former military practitioner, 7th Fleet Commander, you know, hey, here's the policy of the US government, and I'm supposed to go execute. But then there's part of me, and maybe it's my UC Berkeley from the 70s showing, hmm, are we really going to send our sailors home in body bags over some spit of sand in the Spratly Islands, question mark. And so, again, we have tried to thread that needle, right? We've tried to parse and go, no, our, ours is all about access to the global commons. Well, that's fine, and saying, yeah, the sovereignty issues are different, but they're really not, especially when the potential adversary takes non- islands and makes them into islands and then expands that, the sovereignty and access to the global commons arguments are completely fused at that point. You can't parse them. And uh, the Philippine government is looking saying, OK, um, the status quo changes. We react. And our treaty ally, and we conduct military exercises with the Philippine military, and so on. And culturally, we are joined at the hip with them. When I was a 7th Fleet commander, if you looked at the number of Philippine Americans that I had in my 20,000 sailors, massive. Okay, So we're going to just not show up. Here's a great scenario for you, one that uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember if Sally was out teaching us at the time. Maybe she came up with it. I don't know. So. You know that at Second Thomas Shoal, uh, the Philippines have, uh, it's an LST that we gave them a long time ago. It's an old amphibious ship, and they call it the Sierra Madre, and they ran it up onto the coral. And it's kind of their version of an artificial island uh, to kind of stake a claim there. And they dutifully have 12 Philippine Marines, or whatever the number is, go out there, and the Chinese fuss. and and they try to resupply. And it's this kind of what the Japanese would call kabuki theater that goes on around this little ship. So let's just say, and it's rusting away. So one night, uh, the Philippine military goes out, pulls that one off, and tries to put a new one on. And the Chinese say no. And you know, there's a kinetic exchange. 
I've scratched my head over that one a lot. Hey, wonder what the 7th Fleet Commander's going to do. At this point, I'm very glad that I'm just a retired amateur <laughs> academic because, I, you know, it's that political will issue goes right to what Admiral uh, Roughhead said about capability and capacity. Capability and capacity, part of that formula, uh, there's a British general that used to write out the formula, and it was times will. If you don't have the will to use it and show up and be willing to take losses, then it's not a real capability, right? So when you get the answer to that one, would you please send it to my Gmail account? That's a great way you framed it. I'm going to clear time for three more questions, and then we're going to wrap it up. There, and then the gentleman with the cap, and then here at the very end. Uh, thank you, reporter from Voice America, Admiral Thomas. Uh, I think I'm the one who is going to chase after you on your remarks on uh, retreat. So does that mean that the, the ability for the United States, with the rising of China's military power, the ability of the United States to project power in the region is declining. Uh, my second question is about the new defense strategy. The new defense strategy points out that China and Russia at the central challenge into the United, United States uh, national security. Do you foresee a clash between China and the United States in the region in, the, in 2018? Thank you. So let me, yeah, let me um, answer that last part first. Uh, I do not see a kinetic exchange between the People's Republic of China and US forces in 2018, or for that matter, uh, down the road. I think that China will continue to accumulate advantage and meet its objectives, okay, uh, without, again, holding us below that threshold. Uh, they've been very effective uh, over the last decade, in my view, and will continue to do that. Um, going back to um, the word that I used, retreat, uh, probably better characterized as relative retreat. Uh, and, and so what I mean by that is that if you just look, and Admiral Roughhead really kind of focused us on this this morning, at numbers of things and willingness to commit resources to a particular area. You know, uh, we all remember from our high school physics class that force equals mass times acceleration. Well, the potential adversary has a huge M, a huge mass, okay, over short distances in this particular environment. For us, this is a long pull, right, logistically and otherwise, with a military that is globally committed and globally distracted. So if you look at that equation, and I've looked at it over the last 10 years, it is effectively a relative retreat in the South China Sea. The other team has more mass. They are starting to accelerate, and therefore they have more force available at any given time than we can muster. That starts to look like our forces, in a relative sense, are retreating. Seven. Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Um, Admiral, uh, you touched on the, uh, the, 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 it's been widely reported that uh, Xi, uh, the Jinping has uh, dressed himself up in military uniforms and made a lot of visits to the, uh, the military themselves. Uh, generally, uh, this is, and he is, does have the technical right to do that given mm -hmm. parts of his own past. But uh, the people, the analysts who have looked at the 19th uh, Party Congress have seen, uh, you know, a massive uh, reorganization which uh, took place in the Central Military Commission, both in the organizational structure, which puts it almost directly under Xi, pulling the strings, mm -hmm. almost like a puppet, and secondly, absolutely, a, a greater, a greater different bureaus in that regard. Yes, right, to total, totally uh, changed that way, and then, and and then they say percentage-wise, uh, a greater turnover in personnel in that uh, department commission than any of the other. Uh, uh, ones and then he stacked them with his own uh, loyalists. So my worry is that uh, 
you, you know, this man seems to have uh, unlimited ambitions. And uh, you mentioned the comparison to Mao, you know, that, that the people are making. Well, Mao is the great military leader, among other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, my worry is that uh, Xi Jinping may be, may be getting a little bit swelled in the head and viewing himself or, or having uh, pretensions uh, to become or be known as also the great Chinese military leader. And if he actually gets the total con this control over the military and is accepted by the military as such, he may, he may pull them into some kind of uh, military adventurism in the way, in the way Putin has done uh, as the head of the uh, Russian military. So do you see there's a possible uh, danger developing w with well, this person? I, yeah, I think that uh, most of the uh, China watchers would uh, agree with your concern that this much concentration of power uh, in one person, uh, and unlike his predecessors, his last three, uh, Zhang Zemin, you know, uh, Hu Jintao, and so on, um, he did not name a successor at the 19th Party Congress. <laughs> so now everybody that would, should have been on five-year notice for a peaceful succession, kind of standard succession protocol, they're all kind of in a three-point stance wondering what that means. Uh, it shouldn't be lost on anybody. If you really want to do a fun thought experiment, look at the Taiwan election timing, and then look at the end of Xi Jinping's next five-year term. If you're going to be a military adventurist and want to ensure your longevity, one of the great ways to do it is perhaps create a crisis that only you can solve. I'm going to finish up with one last question, and then we'll adjourn for lunch. Hi, uh, my name is Joanie, reporter from VOA's Korean Service. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about North Korean issues. Um, the U.S. is reviewing strategy such as marine time um, interdiction or naval blockade, if you want to call it blockade, or quarantine. Um, how effective they would be, um, I mean, how realistic they would be in the effectiveness of such a blockade and what are the limits of that um, and then yeah. what, what is your recommendation yeah I, I don't think anybody would follow my recommendation trust me um, but uh, from a naval blockade perspective a, a maritime blockade can be very effective if you have the proper mandate and the proper support my understanding right now is um, the UN mandate for maritime interdiction with respect to North Korean sanctions is fairly limited. In other words, we can ask a ship's master, hey, you know, we have kind of concerns here. Can we board your ship for the purpose of an inspection? And that ship's master can say absolutely not. And we don't have a mandate. We, the, the ROC Navy, uh, the U.S. Seventh Fleet, other international players, we don't have a mandate to do a non-compliant boarding and potential seizure of assets on that ship. What we can do, and what has been done, uh, even commercially, is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance of activities of illegal sanctions busting, especially in the oil regime. I think everybody here is very, very clear. You do not really change the North Korean calculus until China truly shuts off the oil, right? So um, that ISR piece, I think with respect to uh, the sanctions, uh, uh, you know, I'll call it blockade busting, if you will, uh, I think that's critically important. Unless the UN Security Council passes another resolution to tighten up the maritime domain, uh, we're going to be in the situation we're in for a long, long time. Tough to do unilaterally with that. A absolutely. That, we got to leave it at there. Uh, that was fascinating. Marvelous. Thanks very much. Yeah.